All right, so uh, now we've gone through uh, a number of vertebrate groups, uh, and we're going to kind of get to the final, not uh, class, but we're going to start to address the last three classes um, of the vertebrates here, and collectively uh, they're referred to as the amniotes. And so the amniote is referring to um, the amniotic sac, right, which is going to be here. Now, actually, I'm going to use the color because I found that uh, it's easier for you to follow, I think, uh, color-wise. So this is the amniotic sac. That contains the embryo. So this little guy here is representing a little vertebrate embryo. And then there's fluid filling the sac, so it's called amni amniotic fluid. Uh, and then the membrane itself is the amniotic membrane. So the, the amniotic sac is sort of the membrane and the fluid combined. So the amniotic sac has a membrane and fluid. And the embryo is suspended in that fluid. So if you recall back to the uh, previous lecture, we were talking about amphibia, uh, that the amphibians are required to be around water for reproduction. So they both have external fertilization and then the embryos develop in the water. They only have a jelly sac, so they would dry out uh, if they were exposed to air. And then the young uh, have gills and they typically respire by uh, extracting oxygen from water. So that's gonna be similar now, except that in a way, I, I mentioned this once before, uh, the idea here is they, there's this older sort of saying, that they take the pond with them. So several aspects of development are going to be the same in that uh, these are tetrapod vertebrates uh, and they're developing in fluid as an embryo, right? but that fluid is contained now with inside this egg. Right? And so that's going to be the idea. The amniotes are the vertebrates that produce eggs. And these are going to be uh, the reptiles, birds, and mammals. Now, we'll go into after after this lecture as we get into uh, talking about the reptiles as a group. Then, then that's where we'll talk about birds and reptiles as paraphyletic groups. Um, I'll keep that separate. We're going to be just focused here on uh, the structure of the amniotic egg. What are the membranes? What are their jobs? Uh, and then how in the mammals, because you're thinking, wait a second, mammals don't lay eggs, but some mammals do, and ancestrally they did. And we have majority of the same membranes and structures uh, in a mammalian embryo, even a, a placental or what we call euthurian mammals. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit of how these uh, structures are reconfigured uh, in the placenta uh, in those groups. So we'll just kind of get at it right now, just describing the different uh, structures and their jobs. So first we have a shell. So the shell is different in the different groups in terms of the material that makes it up. For example, a bird shell is typically calcified and hard, whereas a reptilian shell is usually more soft and leathery and requires to often be around moisture, uh, but it doesn't have to be in the, in the water or um, to um, you know, retain its uh, structure or, or for the embryo uh, to develop. So the shell is a protective um, environment. And then there's fluid right, right inside the shell surrounding this whole thing. So this whole compartment here is then full of uh, fluid here. All right, and that fluid is an albumin, which is a protein rich fluid that both protects the embryo and it can also provide nutrients right, for the embryo as well. Though not directly, which we'll see what the, the yolk's going to do that, but, um, but it can also provide nutrients for the embryo. Now, surrounding everything else that we're going to talk about, so we're going to have the embryo and the amniotic sac, which I already mentioned, and then we're going to have these two other structures, right? So, and then there's going to be something else surrounding everything still with inside the fluid the, of the albumin and then with inside the shell. So what is this here? So this structure here 
this structure as we're talking about here. It's called a chorion. So it's a membrane. And uh, a key importance of this chorion uh, is that we're also going to find it in, in really all the groups. So the, the, the reptiles, birds that lay the eggs, the mammals that lay the eggs, and then the mammals that have other variations of development. So as we talk about mammals, we're going to break them into groups that will be the, the egg-laying mammals, the marsupials, and then the eutherians or the placental mammals. They're all going to still have a chorion. Right. So all those all those groups. So the placental mammals have a chorion. We have a chorion as we develop. So all those things are going to be the same. So keep that in mind that that one's going to always stay uh, pretty much as it is. And so is the amniotic sac. That's going to remain in all the groups. Same function, same basic structure. Everything's the same for, for all these groups of organisms. What's going to be rearranged a little bit in some of the groups are going to be these two structures here. So this one is going to be the yolk. All right, so we have a yolk sac, all right, so the outer membrane is the yolk sac, and then inside uh, is the yolk with a lot of fatty nutrients. So keep this in mind, right, when you think about this. Um, this vertebrate animal is going to develop everything. It's going to develop all of its tissues. It's going to develop its bones and its blood and its nervous system, all of its organs and everything. It's going to require raw materials to do that, which are going to be proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and then the nucleotides for the DNA and RNA. So where is all those, where are all those things going to come from? Where's the energy going to come from? Where are the molecules going to come from? Well, the, the yolk really stores all these nutrients to build the whole organism. So this is how important it is. Um, and, and so the or organism is going to be connected I don't want to use a different color to confuse you. So uh, it's going to be connected all right, to the yolk sac like this. And in addition, what we have is another structure. So we have this one here that I coded in purple. Um, all right, an allantois. Now, this structure here is one that you might be the least familiar with. Well, probably another haven't heard of the Corian before, uh, perhaps as well. But the allantose is a structure that's going to uh, store waste, for one, uh, usually nitrogenous waste. So think about it. The embryo uh, is a living multicellular organism. Uh, it is undergoing metabolism. Uh, as it develops, all of its cells individually are undergoing their metabolism, and they produce metabolic waste, the organism is going to start to produce waste itself, and that waste is going to have to go somewhere. When an organism is in, uh, say, a pond, that diffusion can kind of take away some of those wastes um, into the water surrounding them. But here, everything is contained within the shell. So we're actually going to find some of the waste will be transported out even into the shell itself over time. So the shells of a, a you know, an unfertilized egg versus a fertilized egg that's had some development versus later development will have different chemical components because some of those things will be taken out actually of the organism and they can be deposited uh, into the shell. But the allantois is what's going to remove a lot of the waste, the metabolic waste that's produced by the embryo and, and pull it away from them. So the embryo is all, it's also going to be, uh, as a second function, it's important, is in gas exchange. Because once again, if the organism is in a lake right, or a stream and it's developing and water is constantly flowing around it or there's a, just a massive body of water, there's going to be a lot of oxygen. Locally, the oxygen can get depleted, but as currents and the water moves around, you can get new fresh water with more um, dissolved oxygen in it. Here again, you have a contained system. So if it were completely sealed, right? So if this shell were completely gas locked, for example, and there was no gas exchange to the outside, the organism would ultimately not get enough oxygen, right? So first off, the shell, keep in mind, is porous. So gas exchange can take place across the shell. And the allantois is the structure for gas exchange. So that means, again, carbon dioxide waste and oxygen can come into the embryo um, through this structure. That also connects here to the embryo. 
Now the embryo itself, as it develops uh, and starts to develop a circulatory system, uh, it'll actually start to put blood vessels right, into both the yolk and more blood vessels right, into the allantois because it's demand, it's need for um, more oxygen, uh, it's waste production, and it's uh, need for nutrients to continue its growth are going to accelerate as it starts to get larger, you know, exponentially with more and more cells, it's going to have more and more needs. All right. And so those are the main structures. So we have a developing embryo inside amniotic fluid. The amniotic fluid protects the embryo. We see that in, in all the groups and in all types of, of mammals as well, the egg layers versus to the placental mammals. The amniotic sac, same thing. You're going to see that in all the eggs and in all the types of mammals. Then connected to the embryo, in all the egg layers, we're going to have the yolk providing it with nutrients and the allantois providing it with gas exchange. Now what we're going to, we're going to see is something a little bit different. So I'm going to try to draw this here, but it's just going to be kind of a quick, so it'll be a little um, more crude uh, drawing. Now, we're going to have, a, I'll try to use the same colors. This is the embryo. Good one there. Uh, and then we're going to have the amniotic sac around the embryo. Right, like this. We are going to still have the chorion, which I did in the, it was actually a lighter green. This is this one here. But uh, what we're going to have, I'll just kind of use the orange for this. This yolk and allantois are going to be essentially replaced with uh, an umbilical cord. In the placental mammals. And so what we're going to see is that's going to then give rise to placenta and then the mother there's going to be the uterine lining so the lining of the uterus and so there are blood vessels right in here from the mother and then there are blood vessels in here right from the embryo, right? And then we'll eventually get direct exchange, you know, between these two. So we're not really focusing on the um, placenta right now in the Euthurian mammals. It's just sort of a, a comparison to kind of show you that we still have the, the chorion. We still have the amniotic sac. Uh, with the amniotic fluid. Uh, but then the others are rearranged, and obviously we don't have a, a shell that develops. Now, what about the marsupials? Okay, so within mammals, there's going to be three groups. Uh, although we're not focusing on mammals right now, it's really a good time to kind of bring this up because this is going to be the difference. So we're going to have with mammals a group called monotremes. Those are the egg layers. We have marsupials. Uh, and they have eutherians. And that's the ones that develop a placenta. All right, so monotremes like this, eutherians, modification. What about the marsupials? It's sort of in between, right? Our possum and uh, kangaroo and other, other animals. And many of them, we have some North American ones uh, where we are. Many of them are in Australia and there's some on other, some other continents, um, but more rare, you know, in terms of uh, mammals. Um, they have sort of a modification where um, they don't develop, obviously, a placenta. They're not placental mammals. They don't have a shell, right? But they do still develop, you know, the embryo still develops in the amniotic sac. It starts to develop the beginnings of some of these structures early on, um, but it runs out sort of, of, of nutrients here very soon, uh, and then it actually hatches out of the chorion uh, inside of its mother, uh, and then it will kind of crawl from... Uh, the uterus into a, a special pouch or it will, where it will continue to develop and feed. Um, so it's, it's its own separate thing, but it has, again, most of the same structures. Um, it's just 
the timing is going to be a little bit different. One of the other things to, to mention is, you know, sort of um, why, you know, why produce um, an egg like this? So, because we said that uh, organisms are going to um, start to invade the land, right? So as vertebrates, they're sort of coming more onto land. The amphibians are this first group of, of vertebrate animals that are really starting to invade the land. Now, there are other types of animals that are already uh, up on land um, before them, like insects, right, from the arthropods. They're doing really well kind of uh, on the land because they've kind of, again, come from the water with ancestors like the crustaceans um, up to, you know, living in all these new habitats and exploiting all these new resources and the plants that are developing on land. So they're starting to have uh, relationships with them and pollination and all. So we have also now vertebrates, you know, coming up onto land and to break sort of that tie in reproduction and it being necessarily close to water, that's sort of the main role of the egg that continues on into the development of a placenta. So one question again might be, but you know, so why, why develop the placenta at all? Why not just keep with the egg laying? So we got with those, the mammals and the mammalian groups. And one of the reasons might, might be that we'll talk about a little bit as we get to the very end material um, that deals with ecology uh, and different strategies of organisms. We'll find that organisms often will either invest a lot of energy into having many offspring or more energy into protecting very few offspring is the, sort of the idea. Uh, and so egg layers tend to have, you know, multiple eggs right, within a clutch, it varies by different groups and different species, um, whereas the placental mammals generally only develop sort of one at a time. So the, we have sort of one individual sort of developing here, um, and it has a lot of protection and care. It stays with the mother all the time. Whereas the eggs, which are laid then out in the environment, can be eaten by predators or they can be crushed or other things can happen to the eggs. So they're, it, although they are generally protected by many species, they can still be damaged or stolen or eaten right? and have something else happen to them. So again, it's a, it's a shift again toward greater parental care to see the organism succeed. And remember... Biological fitness is not about you know individuals. Biological fitness is really about the success of genes of a species or population in successfully going on to future generations. So essentially, the more offspring you have, the greater the biological fitness will be. The more genes will be passed on. Those offspring, though, have to survive long enough to be able to reproduce themselves. So in addition to that, care for the young who can't care for themselves is also going to be really important. So there's a balance and trade-off between either in some type of investment, that there's an investment in the care or the investment in the numbers. Um, and those, that's all about sort of species of organisms passing on their genes to future generations. So it all kind of ties back to the you know, genetics and the, the ecology aspect. But here we're just kind of focusing on this structure. So just make sure you can kind of uh, have the basic uh, terms uh, for the different membranes and structures within an egg. Uh, and just a very general description of you know, what is their purpose. You know, so the chorion is sort of the thing that kind of collects them all. There's some gas exchange that's also going to occur uh, across the chorion. So keep that in mind. But it's the uh, allantois that has in the blood vessels uh, it, within it from the embryo. So that's going to be like the major gas exchange. So if you read somewhere, you might see both of them in gas exchange because obviously if gases are coming from outside the shell and going through here, they're going to have to pass through the chorion. So there's gas exchange going on. But it's the allantois that's really the, the major structure that's more actively involved in the gas exchange. Nutrients, sort of a protective layer. And the amni amniotic fluid really cushions the embryo so that if anything happens physically to the egg, the embryo is, is pretty well protected with inside that structure. Um, all right. And so that's those are the main parts and pieces, you know, of uh, the amniotic egg. And so what we'll do now is we're going to um, go into reptiles and that's going to be uh, a look at the groups, you know, and the, the paraphyletic nature of the reptiles. So we'll be looking more at cladogram and uh, some details within the, the groups within there. And then we'll talk about birds specifically uh, as a unique group and some of their, their unique traits. And then we'll end with the mammals.